How's it going folks? Welcome back to another alternate history scenario. The focus of the video today is the nation of Czechoslovakia, a landlocked nation in Central Europe that existed from 1918 until its peaceful dissolution in 1992. Today, we shall explore a scenario that not only sees a democratic Czechoslovakia survive, but thrive in the Cold War era. Now let's get into it. Ah, Czechoslovakia. After centuries of being the land on which great empires clashed in numerous eras of foreign rule, on October 28, 1918, a united modern Czechoslovak state was born out of the chaos of World War I and the collapse of Austria-Hungary. With the groundwork for the new nation already laid by a national revival movement in the 1800s, the new Czechoslovak state prospered under the leadership of Tomáš Masaryk, Czechoslovakia's first president. Perhaps no one better embodied the spirit of new Czechoslovakia than Masaryk, a Czechoslovak politician and philosopher regarded as the founding father of the nation. Masaryk ruled the nation from 1918 until 1935, presiding over a golden age of modernization, progress, and democratic governance for the Czechoslovak people. Upon his retirement in 1935, he was succeeded by his protege, Edvard Benesch. However, as the world entered the 1930s, Central Europe began to destabilize as totalitarian regimes in Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union began imposing their imperialist wills upon smaller nations. By 1933, Czechoslovakia was the only democracy remaining in Central Europe. Because Czechoslovakia was a multi-ethnic state that included sizable minorities of Germans and Hungarians, major problems began to arise. Following Germany's annexation of Austria in 1938, German dictator Adolf Hitler began pressuring Czechoslovakia to give Germany the Sudetenland, which were regions in western Czechoslovakia with large German populations. Although Czechoslovakia was against this, the national government was compelled to give up the territory to Germany after France and Britain acquiesced to Hitler's demands in September 1938. Hitler declared that the Sudetenland represented the end of his imperialist ambitions. As we all know, however, this would not be the case. Following the loss of the Sudetenland, President Benesch was forced to resign by the Germans on October 5, 1938. Benesch would be replaced by Emil Hakka as president. Hakka was an extraordinarily weak leader, and during his time in power, Czechoslovakia was partitioned by Germany into the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, which was annexed by Germany, and the Slovak Republic, which was a puppet state of Germany. By the spring of 1939, Czechoslovakia had ceased to exist, and the Czechoslovak people were in crisis. It was during this time that former president Edvard Benesch made a political comeback, and in 1939, Benesch began organizing a Czechoslovak government in exile with help from other former Czechoslovak politicians, based in France and the UK. After the beginning of the Second World War and the fall of France, Edvard Benesch was recognized by the Allied powers as the legitimate leader of Czechoslovakia once more, and it was Benesch who led the government in exile throughout the war, during which many Czechoslovak soldiers fought alongside the other Allied nations in hopes of liberating their country from the horrific rule of the Nazis. Perhaps the most notable exploit of the Czechoslovak freedom fighters during the war was the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich the Nazi administrator for the western region of Czechoslovakia and widely considered one of the worst members of the Nazi regime, and that's saying something. Throughout the war, President Benesch and the government in exile worked hard to ensure the restoration of the Czechoslovak state as it had been before the war, united, free, and independent. Sadly, this would not be the case. On May 5, 1945, as the war in Europe came to an end, a momentous event known as the Prague Uprising occurred. With Nazi Germany on the verge of collapse, the people of Prague, the Czechoslovak capital, rose up against their Nazi oppressors in a military rebellion spearheaded by elements of the Czechoslovak army and partisans, as well as Russian collaborationist forces who switched sides to fight against the Nazis. On the 5th of May, mass protests against the German occupation broke out in Prague, with radios beginning to broadcast in the Czech language and huge crowds of people pouring into the streets with Czechoslovak flags. By the end of the day, the rebels had seized much of the city. UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill advocated for the liberation of Prague by the Western Allies, as US General George Patton had recently entered into Western Czechoslovakia. However, the Soviet Union also had its eyes set on liberating Prague themselves. The Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, United States General Dwight Eisenhower, was not inclined to incur American casualties in Prague or risk incurring the wrath of the Soviets by liberating Prague first and Allied support for the Prague Uprising never materialized. 
Fighting between the rebels and the Nazis continued until a ceasefire between the two sides was announced on May 9th. The Nazis were eager to flee west and surrender to the U.S., while the Czechoslovak rebels had been decimated by the German military and were unable to hold out any longer. The Germans departed Prague on the morning of May 9th, 1945, and soon after that, the Red Army reached the city, liberating Prague and sealing Czechoslovakia's fate. On May 16th, 1945, the Czechoslovak government in exile was returned to power in the capital of Prague, led by President Edvard Beneš. However, problems arose soon after. Lingering resentment towards the Western Allies for their complacency during the partition of Czechoslovakia and during the Prague Uprising fueled support for the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and its General Secretary, Klement Gottwald. By the time Czechoslovakia held elections in 1946, the Communist Party had over a million members. In the 1946 election, the Czechoslovak Communists won a greater percentage of the votes than any other party, garnering 38% of the vote. Although President Beneš's rule continued after the election, a coalition government between the communists and non-communists was formed, with communist leader Klement Gottwald becoming prime minister and appointing communists into positions of power across the Czechoslovak government's ministries. Following the Czechoslovak government's commencement of negotiations with the Western Allies regarding Czechoslovakia's inclusion within the Marshall Plan, the Czechoslovak communists became increasingly radical abandoning their previous democratic rhetoric and adopting a more militaristic identity, warning of impending reactionary plots in Czechoslovakia masterminded by the West. On Moscow's orders, the communists pulled their previous support for Marshall Plan negotiations, turning public opinion against them as Western Europe prepared to rebuild utilizing the Marshall Plan funds. By the end of 1947, the communists had begun to lose popularity across Czechoslovakia as the government ministries under communist control implemented unpopular policies that damaged the economic livelihoods of many Czechoslovak workers. Although the anti-communists enjoyed a 17 to 9 majority in the government, the communists had infiltrated the police and armed forces as well as much of the civil service. As the months went by, communist control over these parts of the government only tightened. It was also during this time that infighting within the government between the communists and non-communists intensified. President Benish himself had grown weary of the communists, as well as justifiably paranoid of their growing influence within his government. In January 1948, the communist-run Czechoslovak Ministry of the Interior, led by zealous communist Václav Nosek, attempted to purge the Czechoslovak National Police of all remaining anti-communist policemen and pack the National Police with loyal Communist Party members, despite his action being wholly illegal. The infiltration of these security forces was viewed as a critical threat to personal freedom in Czechoslovakia, and following Nosek's bold attempt to seize further power, the anti-communist elements of the Czechoslovak government called for him to be punished for his actions. The Czechoslovak communists only doubled down, mobilizing their supporters across the nation, which led to 12 non-communist members of the government's cabinet submitting their resignations in protest and also in hope of President Benesch refusing their resignations and forming a new caretaker government free of communists. However, President Benesch was fearful of the communists and worried such actions might foment a communist revolt and lead to a Soviet takeover of the nation, and chose to remain neutral. Looking back on this, historians widely share the view that had Benesch taken swift action and stood strong with the anti-communists, the communist takeover of Czechoslovakia might have been avoided. Sadly, this was not what happened. By early February 1948, Czechoslovakia was in crisis. Communist demonstrations broke out across Prague demanding a new communist government be formed. The Czechoslovak armed forces had fallen under communist control and did not intervene. Prime Minister Gottwald threatened a general strike unless President Benesch gave in to his demands to form a new communist-dominated government. President Benesch, although he'd been a wartime icon of resistance, had been in bad health since suffering a stroke in 1945 and was unable to handle the situation effectively as he was very physically frail by 1948. On February 25, 1948, President Benesch conceded to Gotwald's demands, and the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia took full control of the nation. The only non-communists remaining in the government at this point were President Benesch himself and Jan Masaryk, foreign minister of Czechoslovakia and son of Czechoslovakia's founding father, Tomáš Masaryk. Two weeks after the coup, Jan Masaryk was found murdered at the foreign ministry. The new communist government oversaw a purge of dissidents throughout Czechoslovak society, with thousands being arrested. The National Assembly, Czechoslovakia's unicameral parliament, 
acquiesced to the communist demands and unanimously approved Clement Gottwald's new government in March of that year. On May 9, 1948, Czechoslovakia adopted a new constitution declaring the nation to be a people's republic. On June 2, 1948, Edvard Benes resigned from the presidency, dying later that year on September 3rd. With the death of President Benes, so came the death of democracy in Czechoslovakia. Following Benes' resignation, Clement Gottwald became the new president of communist Czechoslovakia, beginning a 41-year-long communist dictatorship in Czechoslovakia, which saw the nation reduced to a satellite state of the Soviet Union. Perhaps the most infamous moment in the history of communist Czechoslovakia came in the Prague Spring of 1968. The Prague Spring began after Alexander Dubček, a democratic socialist and reformist, came to power in Czechoslovakia as the nation's first secretary. First Secretary Dubček sought to democratize the nation and restore human rights to the Czechoslovak people. These reforms, while very popular nationwide, were viewed as an existential threat by the Soviet Union, who reacted to the democratic reforms by sending half a million Warsaw Pact troops to crush Dubček's government. After eight months of this, the democratic movement in Czechoslovakia was stopped by the Soviet Union, dooming Czechoslovakia to another 21 years of communist rule. In November 1989, as the end of the Cold War neared, mass protests against the communist dictatorship of Czechoslovakia broke out across the country after riot police suppressed a student protest on November 17th. The protests quickly snowballed out of control, with the number of protesters growing from 200,000 to 500,000 in just 24 hours. On November 24th, the entire communist leadership resigned. On November 27th, a two-hour general strike paralyzed the nation. On November 28, 1989, the communist government announced the end of one-party rule in Czechoslovakia, and throughout the rest of 1989 and 1990, Czechoslovakia successfully democratized in a peaceful revolution today known as the Velvet Revolution. Amidst resurgent nationalism among the nation's politicians, as well as resulting issues in maintaining a functioning federal government in the face of the growing divide between Czech and Slovak politicians, on December 31, 1992, Czechoslovakia was dissolved, and the two states of the Czech Republic and Slovakia were born. All of this occurred despite the fact that only 37% of Slovaks and 36% of Czechs favored the dissolution of the country, and no referendum on the matter was ever held. Today, both Slovakia and the Czech Republic are developed nations and members of the European Union and NATO. However, the modern-day prosperity of these two nations was achieved despite the four decades of communist oppression, not because of it. Furthermore, the dream of a united Czechoslovakia was not able to survive the 20th century. But, what if both of these statements were false? What if Czechoslovakia not only remained united, but also escaped communist rule? Let's find out. Our point of divergence is simple. Czechoslovakia's alternate timeline begins during the chaos of the Prague Uprising. Just as in our timeline, on May 5, 1945, the Prague Uprising begins. Events proceed the same as in our timeline, as rebel forces under the command of Czechoslovak generals Karl Kutulvasher and František Slunečko begin to take the Czechoslovak capital back from the Germans. The rebel morale is high, as the day prior, United States forces under the command of General George Patton had entered western Czechoslovakia. By the end of the day, on May 5, 1945, most of Prague is under rebel control, as the Germans scramble to mount a counterattack. Hearing of the events in Prague, Prime Minister Winston Churchill of the United Kingdom urgently contacts the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, General Dwight Eisenhower, imploring him to launch an attack on German forces in Prague. That same night, General George Patton also requests Eisenhower's permission to march on Prague. Unlike in our timeline, where Eisenhower decided not to intervene to prevent unnecessary American casualties and appease the Soviet Union, in this alternate timeline, General Eisenhower instead decides to authorize a military offensive to liberate Prague. While Eisenhower retains his concerns over how this will go over with the Soviets, he'd been convinced that action was necessary regardless of the political implications. The people of Prague were fighting for their liberty, and the United States of America was going to help them win it. On May 6, 1945, the United States Third Army advanced from the nearby city of Pilsen to the city of Prague, where they encountered meager German resistance and a grateful populace. Upon hearing that the United States Third Army had arrived to liberate Prague, 
Prague's Nazi commander, General Rudolf Toussaint, immediately ordered all German forces in Prague to stand down and surrender, knowing that if they attempted to resist the Americans, they would just be destroyed. On May 6, 1945, Prague is successfully liberated by the United States of America, dooming knowledge of the planned Soviet liberation of Prague to forever be a fun fact shared amongst World War II history buffs. Following the American liberation of Prague, the Soviet military leadership is enraged, viewing Eisenhower as having overstepped his bounds. Nevertheless, the Soviet-backed Kosice program, a document outlining the nature of the post-war Czechoslovak government signed by both the Czechoslovak communists and the Czechoslovak government in exile, remains the governing agreement for the post-war reconstitution of the Czechoslovak state. The implications of this are that the Czechoslovak communists under Klement Gottwald still enjoy some powers within the new provisional government. As in our timeline, many government ministries, from the Ministry of Defense to the Ministry of the Interior, are set to be led by communists. On May 10, 1945, President Edvard Benes returns to Prague, and the government in exile is returned to power as the Czechoslovak people rejoice. Communist leader Klement Gottwald also gains political influence as a result of the Košice program. Czechoslovakia during this time is a nation busy rebuilding after the end of World War II. The rest of 1945 is spent restarting the basic functions of the government as the Americans and Soviets begin withdrawing their forces from Czechoslovakia. The Soviets depart hoping that Klement Gottwald will soon seize power, while the Americans depart confident that President Benes will be a champion of democracy in post-war Czechoslovakia. However, almost immediately, problems arise for the Czechoslovak communists. Following the liberation of Prague, during the summer of 1945, a wave of pro-Western and pro-American sentiment had swept across Czechoslovakia, with many of the nation's citizens considering the liberation of Prague to have been the West's redemption after they had abandoned the Czechoslovak people during the era of the Munich Agreement and the partition of the country by the Nazis. Under pressure from the Soviets, Klement Gottwald and the Communists are on a tight schedule to begin their consolidation of power in time for the upcoming elections scheduled for November of 1946. Although Gottwald pleads with his Soviet masters to give him more time, Stalin is resolute that the Communists must seize power before they are voted out of the government. With these instructions, Gottwald and the Communists spend the rest of 1945 and 1946 building up their political power as much as they can, but this is much more difficult than in our timeline due to the Western Allies being much more influential in this alternate post-war Czechoslovakia. Benish's new provisional government undertakes the same initiatives as in our timeline, such as the expulsion of the Germans and Hungarians from Czechoslovakia. However, in this timeline, President Benish also enjoys much closer relations with Washington, D.C. as a result of him and General George Patton striking up a personal friendship following the liberation of Prague. Closely monitoring ongoing developments in post-war Eastern Europe, the United States government, at General Patton's urging, takes a larger interest in the fate of Czechoslovakia. President Benish himself enjoys a less stressful presidency in the early days of the restored government, due to less pressure from his political rival, Gottwald. With the communists too busy to present a constant political challenge to Benish, this gives the president more time to work on developing his political brand, as well as monitor events within the nation. By October 1945, President Benes had concluded that the Košice program was an unfair agreement imposed upon Czechoslovakia by Gottwald and Stalin. Instead of our timeline's complacent Benes, in this alternate timeline we have proactive Benes. On November 15, 1945, President Benes announces the relaunch of his political party, the Czech National Social Party, no relation to the German one. This relaunch follows the recent merger of several smaller parties, including the Czech National Social Party, Czechoslovak People's Party, and the Democratic Party, among others, into a brand new political party, the Republican Vanguard. The Republican Vanguard is a vanguard party that promotes democracy, human rights, and Czechoslovakism, also known as Czechoslovak nationalism. This last tenet is in direct violation of the Košice program, which prohibited the adoption of Czechoslovakism by the new government. President Benes included this within the party program as a quiet challenge to the Czechoslovak communists. With Gottwald and his cronies currently busy growing the party membership, the formation of the Republican vanguard flies under the communists' radar. On December 1, 1945, President Benes is alerted to an ongoing campaign by the communists to take over independent labor unions as a means to spread their currently weak influence in Czechoslovakia. As a result, President Benes launches a secret initiative for the Republican vanguard to do the same, and by the end of 1945, 
the first efforts by the Republican vanguard to expand into the country's labor unions had already begun to bear fruit. Dozens of unions in Prague whose leaders had pro-Western views accepted the Republican vanguard's overtures and became party-affiliated unions, hoping to stave off communist attempts to secure the allegiance of the entire Czechoslovak proletariat. While the anti-communist political forces of Czechoslovakia had consolidated their power following the end of the war, Gottwald and the communists had begun to suffer under the strict deadlines imposed by Moscow. As 1946 dawned on the nation, collectivization and nationalization campaigns launched by the communist-controlled government ministries had backfired on the communists and cost them the support of many working-class people in Czechoslovakia, not to mention the fact that the party was hemorrhaging support from farmers and other agricultural workers. Quota impositions in communist-dominated unions and factories further worsened the situation for the communists, even though they had only been following the party program imposed upon them by Moscow. Unfortunately for them, the party program had been drafted in late 1944 as part of Soviet plans for post-war domination of Czechoslovakia. It had not accounted for a Western liberation of Prague and an outpouring of support for the anti-communists of the nation. The last straw came in the summer of 1946, when a massive scandal known as the police plot was uncovered. Following an investigation by a local newspaper, Malada Frontanes, that involved interviews with policemen and police unions across Czechoslovakia, it came to light that corrupt Minister of the Interior, Václav Nosek, had been illegally attempting to pack the police ranks with party members and purged the national police of anti-communists. The following national outcry against Václav Nosek is so severe that the Czechoslovak communists, now viewing Nosek as a liability so close to the election, have no choice but to order him to deliver his resignation to President Benish, knowing all too well that Benish will appoint a non-communist to replace Nosek. Following the resignation of Nosek in July 1946, the anti-communists in Czechoslovakia had decisively gained the upper hand. To replace Nosek, President Benish appoints General Heliodor Pica, an ardent anti-communist, to be the next Minister of the Interior. General Pica spends the penultimate months before the election undoing the damage that Nosek had wrought upon the nation's security forces, successfully depoliticizing the national police in time for the 1946 election, reinstating officers fired for their anti-communism and firing officers hired for their loyalty to the party. On November 4th, 1946, an election is held nationwide for control of the National Assembly, pitting the Republican vanguard against the Czechoslovak Communist Party, with various smaller parties allying themselves with either of the larger two. The result of the election horrifies the Soviets, with 99.5% of the eligible populace voting in an election certified free and fair by international observers, the Republican vanguard earns a whopping 49% of the vote compared to the Communist Party, which only garners 10% of the vote. The night of the election, President Benish partakes in a midnight victory rally with the people of Prague, with the Republican vanguard having garnered 65% of the vote within that city alone. By his side in the presidential motorcade is the leader of the Republican vanguard party, Mr. Jan Ursine, now set to become the leader of the National Assembly. Following the devastating communist defeat in the elections, communist leader Clement Gottwald is immediately recalled to Moscow, replaced by communist hardliner Antonin Novotny. On January 20th, 1947, the new National Assembly is inaugurated as the Czechoslovak communists under Antonin Novotny plan their next move. Under the leadership of the recently executed Clement Gottwald, the communists had failed to make any inroads in Czechoslovakia. This was unacceptable for the Soviet Union. If the Czechoslovak people were to be, quote, liberated from capitalist tyranny, end quote, a revolution would be required to topple the Benish regime. With a new, much friendlier National Assembly, President Benish announces in a radio speech on March 1st, 1947, that the time had come for Czechoslovakia to forge her own path. Accordingly, Benish announced that the nation would be withdrawing from the Soviet-backed Košice program that had shaped the nation's government since the end of the war. With the Košice program gone, Czechoslovakia would be undergoing reforms throughout 1947 to enshrine the nation's republican character within its government. Throughout the rest of 1947, President Benesh and National Assembly leader Jan Ursine launched various reforms, including the conversion of the National Assembly into the Czechoslovak Congress, abolishing the office of Prime Minister, and the creation of the office of Vice President, all done in consultation with the National Assembly. For his Vice President, President Benesh selects the son of former President Tomasz Masaryk, Foreign Minister Jan Masaryk. 
Although many had worried that these bold reforms would incur the wrath of the Soviets, President Benish was firm in his belief that because the nation was not liberated by the Soviets alone, coupled with the fact that his political party had just won an electoral mandate, the Soviets could not make a move on Czechoslovakia without sparking an international crisis. And he was right. On June 5, 1947, Czechoslovakia accepts an invitation from the United States to attend a meeting regarding the Marshall Plan an American initiative to provide massive amounts of foreign aid to help Europe rebuild after the war. The Czechoslovak government, whose representatives were present at the meeting, is enthusiastic about the possibilities represented by the Marshall Plan. On July 1, 1947, after a vote is held in the National Assembly, Czechoslovakia opts to receive aid from the Marshall Plan and officially joins the initiative, only further enraging the Soviet Union, who with a moribund Czechoslovak communist movement, are completely unable to influence events inside the country without launching an invasion. As Czechoslovakia pivots towards a decidedly anti-communist position, many refugees from nations such as Poland begin fleeing to freedom in Czechoslovakia. Amid the sweeping changes implemented by the Republican vanguard, the communists struggle to recoup their losses with the public, and especially with the working class. After several failed recruitment drives and propaganda campaigns, by late 1947, the communist strategy shifts to putting everything on the table and launching an all-or-nothing rebellion in the streets of Prague with the hope of inciting a workers' revolution and toppling the Benish government. If this effort is not launched soon, once the Marshall Plan takes effect, the communist cause in Czechoslovakia will be hopeless. On February 25, 1948, Four days later than originally planned, due to several militias abandoning the cause at the last minute, thousands of communists, armed with guns smuggled in from Poland, converge on Prague and begin battling the national police in the streets. As the violence only escalates, martial law is declared, as Ministry of the Interior, General Heliodor Pica, eager to restore the peace, authorizes the deployment of the Czechoslovak army into the streets of Prague, with orders to kill any communists on sight, as tanks are deployed to end the rebellion. Antonin Novotny himself is killed after being shot in the throat in the streets of Prague as the Czechoslovak armed forces crush the rebels, with the failed 1948 coup ending in a government victory in a massive embarrassment to the Soviet Union. On February 26, 1948, a visibly shaken President Benish delivers a speech in Prague under heavy security to a group of his closest supporters. Benish states that while Czechoslovakia had long dreamed of living in peace with the Soviet Union, and that this had always been his goal personally, this dream had been shattered after the rebellion that they had fomented. Benish states with a heavy heart that despite his democratic values, he has no choice but to ban the Czechoslovak Communist Party effective immediately. In the months following the coup attempt, President Benish oversees a propaganda campaign promoting national unity and harmony to the traumatized nation. A major turning point following the failed coup attempt comes in the summer of 1948, when Czechoslovakia begins receiving aid from the Marshall Plan, marking the beginning of an economic boom nationwide. Sadly, despite this era's prosperity, President Benish, having suffered three strokes since 1945, had long been in poor health. Although he'd been able to stand his ground this long, he knew his health was waning. With this in mind, Following a stern warning from his doctors, on September 2nd, 1948, President Edvard Benish announces that he will be stepping down as president, with Vice President Jan Masaryk becoming the third Czechoslovak president at midnight on September 3rd, 1948. To the nation's shock, that same day, President Benish passes away due to natural causes at the age of 64. One month of mourning is proclaimed as Czechoslovakia mourns the loss of the president who'd led them through hell and back. Overseeing a level of prosperity never before experienced in the nation, President Masaryk, a strong-willed leader, takes office at just the right time. On April 4, 1949, as a result of the terrifying experience of the failed 1948 coup attempt, Czechoslovakia becomes a signatory of the North Atlantic Treaty and a founding member of NATO. In the 1950 presidential election, the first held under the current government, President Masaryk handily wins re-election, able to serve a complete term of his own now. Going into the 1950s, with the economy continuing to grow and much of the country rebuilt, under a free and democratic government, Czechoslovak culture and art enter into a new renaissance, with Czechoslovak media and culture being exported throughout Western Europe and the nation enjoying a tourist boom from the United States. 
At the same time, the Czechoslovak government, knowing full well that they are surrounded by hostile communist nations to the east, invests heavily in border security and maintains a large army through mandatory two-year military service for all able-bodied males 18 and up. In the 1954 election, the term-limited President Masaryk is succeeded by Helidor Pica, a national hero who made a name for himself for his fierce loyalty to the late President Benesh during the war and heroics during the 1948 coup attempt. Under the rule of General Pika and his vice president, Bohumil Lauschmann, the Republican vanguard makes further gains in its popularity nationwide. In the 1958 election, General Pika loses re-election to a challenger from within the Republican vanguard, the charismatic Karol Kutlwasser, the hero and commander of the Prague Uprising. Surprisingly, General Pika then makes a political comeback in the 1962 election, thwarting Kutlwasser's re-election and becoming the only Czechoslovak president to serve two terms non-consecutively. In the 1966 presidential election, the Republican vanguard loses its first election to a new opposition party, the Social Democrats, which is a centrist party inspired by social democracy. Republican vanguard candidate Jaromir Nahansky loses to the candidate of the Social Democrats, Milada Horakova, who wins the election with 55% of the vote and becomes the first female president of Czechoslovakia, ending the post-war dominance of the Republican vanguard in Czechoslovakia. President Horakova's two terms in office from 1967 to 1975 are marked by the flourishing of a large countercultural movement in Prague, inspired by the hippies of the United States, the economy of Czechoslovakia reaching parity with the West German economy, to the shock of economists across the world, and the first color broadcast in Czechoslovak history, which takes place on October 28, 1968, the 50th anniversary of Czechoslovak independence. The first color broadcast is of President Horakova delivering an impassioned speech, celebrating the heroes of Czechoslovak history, as well as the fact that despite all of the challenges the nation has faced, today, in 1968, they are more prosperous, more united, than they have ever been before. The broadcast ends with a performance by Czechoslovak singer Marta Kubišová, accompanied by many other famous Czechoslovak singers singing the national anthem. This era of prosperity during the 1960s would later be referred to as the Prague Miracle. President Horakova would later be succeeded by her vice president, Alexander Dubček, who goes on to win the 1974 election. Following the era of the Prague Miracle, Czechoslovakia would hit a slump in the late 1970s due to the global economic downturn, only to bounce back in the 1980s during the return of the Republican vanguard party to dominance and the presidency of Václav Havel. In 2002, Czechoslovakia officially adopts the euro as its main currency, heralding an era of further integration with the rest of Europe, as well as with its neighbors to the east after the fall of communism. On February 25, 2024, Czechoslovakia, now led by former Czechoslovak army general Petr Pavel, was a nation at peace with its past, its present, and its future. The Czechoslovak people had beaten fascism, communism, and every other threat imaginable and they had done it all while staying united and true to the values their nation had been founded on so many years ago.